Okay, let's continue on with diluted earnings per share. I want to do multiple choice number 63. Number 63 is found on page 540. And number 63 says, the diluted earnings per share for 2008 is what? I'm actually going to calculate both basic and diluted. Number 63 says the Peters Corporation's capital structure was as follows. And they give us December 31st, 2007 and 2008. Doesn't look like anything's changed here. The number of shares of common stock outstanding is 110,000 and 110,000. And the number of shares of convertible preferred stock is 10,000 and 10,000. Okay? During 2008, Peters paid dividends of $3 per share on its preferred stock. Now, I'm going to assume that that's the current year preferred stock dividend. All right? That $3 per share, I'm going to assume that's the current year preferred stock dividend for the purposes of basic earnings per share. The preferred shares are convertible into 20,000 shares of common stock, and they're considered to be common stock equivalents. Net income for 2008 was 850,000. Assume the income tax rate is 30%. They're trying to trick you there by trying to trick you with uh, net of tax bond interest expense. The diluted earnings per share for 2008 is how much? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do both the basic and diluted. And remember that the basic is inside the box. The uh, net income starts off with 850,000. And the current year preferred stock dividend, I'm just going to assume that the dividend that they paid, which is $3 per share, and there's 10,000 shares, is $30,000, and that's the current year. I'm just going to assume that, so I've got minus $30,000. How did I get that? It was $3 per share times the 10,000 shares, okay? And then the weighted average number of common stock shares outstanding, it was uh, 110,000 outstanding the entire year, so 110,000 times 12 months over 12 months is going to be 110,000. They were all outstanding during 2008 because it didn't change from 2000 to 2008. So you have 850,000 minus the 30,000. Divide that by 110,000. That's going to give you, ooh, an ugly number, $7.45, which is basic. Okay, do they have that answer there for number 63? Yes. That would be answer D if they wanted basic. But what did they want instead? They wanted diluted. Now, diluted, remember we're using the if converted method. The if converted. If, if we had converted all that convertible preferred stock into shares of common stock, see, I had a question mark up here, we would not have to pay this. And the reason we wouldn't have to pay it, there would be no more preferred stockholders. They would just be common stockholders. So this then would become minus zero. The current year preferred stock dividend for the purposes of diluted earnings per share would go away. Then we'll have to figure out what's the number of common stock equivalents because then they would become shares of common stock. And it says that the preferred shares are convertible into 20,000 shares of common stock. So that would be then 20,000. But don't forget to prorate this. Was the 20,000 shares, were the convertible preferred stock, was that outstanding the entire year? Yes, it was, because it went at, from December 31st, 2007 to December 31st, 2008 was 10,000. It didn't change. So I know that this was outstanding 12 months over 12 months, so that's 20,000. Don't forget to always weight it, so your common stock equivalents are 20,000. So then you take 850,000 minus the current year preferred stock dividend. There has nothing to do with convertible bonds in this question. All over, the weighted average number of common stock shares outstanding, which is 110,000, plus the common stock equivalent, which is 20,000. So what you would have in the numerator is 850,000. Divide that by 110 plus 20 is 130,000. And then you would get about $6.54. About that. It's approximately. And this would be the diluted earnings per share. This would be the diluted earnings per share. So let's answer the question. The diluted earnings per share for 2008 is $6.54, so the correct answer there would be B, like Barbara. By the way, do you remember at the very beginning I said that you could calculate basic and diluted for I, D, E, and net income? It's the exact same formula as what, you show, what I show you for basic and diluted earnings per share. Instead of substitute, substitute instead of net income, if it's income from continuing operations, you put that here. If it's discontinued operations, you put that here. If it's your ordinary gains and losses, you put that here. But mainly, they will ask mostly for net income. That's what they ask for, mostly. Okay. So the best answer then for number 63 is B like Barbara for diluted earnings per share and D like David for basic earnings per share. All right. Um, let's take a look at multiple choice number um, 60. Do I want to do? Oh, yeah. This is a good one. Number 67. Number 67 is kind of a 
Well, does it have to do with preferred stock? Okay. All right. It does have to do with some bonds. So let's just deal with number 65 first. And then we'll do number 67. And then we'll finish up with 70. And I'll show you um, how to calculate the diluted and earning, uh, basic earnings per share in the simulation. Uh, uh, if you take a look on um, number 65. Number 65 is found on page 540. And number 65 says, what is Le Mans 2008 diluted earnings per share? Okay. On June 30th of 2007, the Le Mans company issued 20 $10,000 7% bonds at par. Each bond was convertible into 200 shares of common stock. So these are convertible bonds payable. You see that? Then on January 1st of 2008, 10,000 shares of the common stock were outstanding. The bondholders converted all the bonds on July 1st, 2008. You don't have to pretend whether or not they did it. They really did it on July 1st, 2008. They converted all the convertible bonds into shares of common stock. The following amounts were reported in Lamont's income statement for the year ended December 31st, 2008. What is Lamont's 2008 diluted earnings per share? All right, I'm going to calculate both the basic earnings per share and the diluted earnings per share. So let's erase this. Okay. First of all, where is the net income? Where do you get the net income from? You get the net income from where? You get that from the income statement, and the income statement on number 65 has net income. It's 35000 Okay. There's no current year preferred stock. We don't have any preferred stock in this example. Um, it says that um, on June 30th, they issued 20, 10,000, issued 20, $10,000, 7% bonds at par. Each bond is convertible into 200 shares of common stock. On January 1st, 2008, 10,000 shares of common stock were outstanding. So if 10,000 shares of common stock were outstanding on January 1st, we say January 1st, 10,000 times 12 months over 12 months gives me 10,000. Then they said that on the bondholders converted all the bonds on July 1st. This really happened, okay? So on July 1st, they had to issue a whole bunch more shares. It says they had 20 $10,000 bonds. So we had 20 bonds. Each was um, convertible into 200 shares of common stock. So 20 times 200 is 4,000. So 20 bonds times 200 shares per bond is 4,000 shares. So 4,000. Now this happened on July 1st. Do you have to wait this? The answer is yes, you do. Because in our formula, assets e uh, equals liabilities plus shareholders' equity. The liabilities are going down and the shareholders' equity is going up because they converted the, the bonds into shares of common stock. So liabilities decrease, shareholders' equity increases. You have to wait any transaction which changes total shareholders' equity. So you would then take the 4,000. This happened on July 1st. You'd multiply that by six months over 12 months. So that would give you 2,000. And so the total weighted average number of common stock shares outstanding would be 12,000. So then you'd take the 35,000, divide by the 12,000, and that would give you about $2.92. So $2.92 would be your basic. So if they had asked for basic at number 65, the answer would be 292, and the answer would be C. Now, they did ask for diluted. Okay. So what does diluted mean? Diluted means you take the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is instead of converting all the bonds on July 1st, because this six months over 12 months, this is for the period of July 1 through December 31. The worst case scenario would be if they took all the bonds and they converted them on January 1st instead of July 1st. If they did that, then there would be no interest expense at all on the income statement because the interest expense here is only for half of the year. So what you would do is let's just pretend and take the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is to convert all the bonds into shares of common stock on January 1st, not July 1st, in which case we wouldn't incur any interest at all on the income statement. So I would have to take the net of tax bond interest expense. The bond interest expense is 7000 according to our income statement. I would have to take that net of tax. To take anything net of tax, you multiply that by 1 minus the tax rate. The tax rate they give us here is income tax at 30%. So 1 minus 30% is 70%. 70% times 7,000 would be 4,900. So what I would be doing is I would add back the $4,900 here. Okay? And that's adding back the $7,000 interest 
net of tax. Why do I have to add it back? Because if I assume the worst case scenarios, and if they converted on January 1st instead of July 1st, then they would have no interest at all on the income statement. So I would have to add that back, net of tax effect. The common stock equivalent would be the same 4,000 shares, but now I'd multiply that by six months over 12 months for 2,000 shares. This six months over 12 months is for the period January 1 to June 30th. Notice, this period here is for July 1 through December 31. That really happened. That's part of BASIC. This is the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is if they converted on January 1, not July 1. In which case, you take the 4,000, multiply that by 6 months over 12 months. That 6 months is for the period January 1 through June 30th. That's another 2,000 shares. So then you would have the 35,000 plus the 4,900 plus the net of tax bond interest expense. Divide that by... 12,000 plus the other 2,000 for common stock equivalents, which is divided by uh, 14,000, that would give you, ooh, I, that did not turn out right, 35,000 <laughs> plus 4,900, divide that by 14,000, I got 285. $2.85 would be my diluted earnings per share. So let's see if we can answer the question. So, for number 65, they want to know what is Lamont's 2008 diluted earnings per share. The best answer for diluted earnings per share is $2.85, which is 35000 plus 4900 which is 39900 Divide that by the 12000 plus the 2000 common stock equivalents, which is 14000 gives you $2.85. The best answer is B, like Barbara. Had they asked for basic, the answer would be C. By the way, diluted earnings per share has always got to look worse, okay? If you have basic and diluted earnings per share, and diluted is looking better than basic earnings per share, that is not allowed. Diluted has always got to be worse. Look, basic, all right? is 292. So, the basic is 292, all right? If something's going to look weaker, if it's going to be diluted, it's going to look worse. What would make it look worse is if it's lower. Look at diluted earnings per share. Diluted earnings per share is 285. That's what you want to see. You want to always have basic be higher and diluted be lower. If it's the opposite, if diluted, see how it's 285? It's 7 cents less. Not that much, but it's still less. The thing is, is if you have diluted looking better than basic, no, no, no. That's not allowed. In that case, basic and diluted would be the same. Okay, in that case, basic and diluted would be the same. When can this happen? This happens oftentimes, which instead of a net income, you have a net loss. And what happens is that if you have a net loss, when you have the number of shares in the denominator go up because of the common stock equivalents, then the loss per share goes down, okay? When you have diluted earnings per share, you're not allowed to show that. So especially be careful, instead of a net income, when you have a net loss situation. In a net loss situation, basic and diluted have to be equal because in diluted earnings per share, when the denominator, when the number of shares goes up, you cannot have earnings per share looking like a smaller loss, okay? That won't, that won't happen, okay? So remember that. Basic here is going to be higher, and that it's 292, and then the diluted is lower, and that's the way it's supposed to be. All right, so basic, the answer is 292, it's C, diluted, the correct answer is answer B. Okay, um, just a couple more multiple choice questions. I want to show you multiple choice number 67. Number 67 is kind of tricky because it's like a theory question, you know. You know, quite frankly, when you have uh, computational questions, you can sort of like back into the right answer with using your calculator, you know. But it's a theory question. You're, you're yes, S-O-L. You either know it or you don't. Number 67 is, uh, it goes on from page 540 to page 540. 41. So we're going to take a look at number 67. Number 67 says, in determining diluted earnings per share, the dividends on non-convertible, it's not convertible, okay. The dividends on non-convertible preferred stock should be what? So when you calculate diluted earnings per share, the only time there's a question of whether you include it in basic and you exclude it in diluted is if it's convertible preferred stock, 
okay? Because if it's convertible preferred stock, then what happens is that that current year preferred stock dividend becomes zero. We already looked at an example like that when we did multiple choice number 63, when we went from basic to diluted, and then suddenly the current year preferred stock dividend became zero. So when they have answer A is disregarded, that answer is wrong, okay? The only time you would disregard it is if it was convertible and cumulative, okay? If it was convertible and cumulative, then you would disregard it, which is the example that we did in number 63, except it wasn't cumulative, they just paid it. So it doesn't matter if it's cumulative or non-cumulative. All right, so it's not answer A. Take a look at answer B. Do you add this back to net income, whether declared or not? Now they're trying to confuse you between convertible preferred stock and convertible bonds. No, the interest would only be added back net of tax effect if you're talking about convertible bonds. We're not talking about convertible bonds here. We're talking about non-convertible cumulative preferred stock. Let's take a look at answer C. Do you deduct it from net income only if you declare it? No. You only worry about whether you deduct it or you don't de deduct it if you're talking about non-cumulative preferred stock. Non-cumulative preferred stock. This says that it's cumulative. It's cumulative. So that only you only have to worry about do I deduct it or I not deduct it. It's always based on whether it's declared or not declared. That has to do with whether it's non-cumulative preferred stock. All right. So then you have to worry about declared or not declared. Here they're already telling you that the preferred stock is cumulative. Then answer D says you deduct it from net income whether you declare it or not. That's true, okay? Because this is non-convertible cumulative preferred stock. The only time that that current year preferred stock dividend would be subtracted in basic, all right, but you leave it as zero and diluted is if it happens to be convertible preferred stock. Here they're telling you it's non-convertible. So no matter what, you're going to have to pay it because you can't convert it into shares of, of, of common stock. So the best answer here would be D, like David, because it's non-convertible cumulative preferred stock. The correct answer is D, like David. Now remember, the way I just did the expl explanation, that's the way you're going to have to study this question. You have to think to my, yourself, when would I do answer B, add back to net income, whether to declare it or not? That has nothing to do with preferred stock. That has to do with convertible bonds, net of tax effect. Okay? You have to think about it that way. That's the way you study these problems. All right? There's just a couple other things that I want to point out to you before I do the um, simulation. A couple of things that I want to point out to you are... Mm -hmm. um, on the bottom page 527, at the bottom page 527, at the very, very bottom page 527, they talk about contingent issuances of common stock. In the contingent issuances of common stock, also mentioned are contingent issuances of common stock at the bottom page 527. For example, stock subscriptions. If shares are to be issued in the future with no restrictions on their issuance or other than the passage of time, then they are to be considered issued and treated as outstanding in the computa computation of diluted earnings per share. So if all that has to happen is time has to pass and these people are going to get their shares, then you're going to include it automatically for diluted earnings per share. You would never include it for basic earnings per share. Okay? Let's take a look at page 528. Okay. Um, other issuances that are dependent upon certain conditions being met are to be evaluated in a different respect. I'm at the top of page 528 now. SFAS number 128 uses as examples the maintenance of current earnings levels and the attainment of specified earnings increases. If the contingency is to merely maintain the earnings levels currently being attained, then the shares are considered outstanding for the inter entire period and considered in the computation of diluted earnings per share, per share if the effect is dilutive. If the requirement is to increase earnings over a over a period of time, then the diluted earnings per share computation should include those shares that would be issued based on the assumption that current amounts of earnings will remain unchanged if the effect is diluted. Okay, what are they talking about here? This is what they're talking about. Oftentimes, company A wants to buy out company B. Company B will say, we're not letting you buy us out unless you really give us a darn good deal. And the darn good deal was, let us buy you out and in three years, we're going to give everybody 10,000 shares. Okay. If that in three years, we're going to give everybody 10,000 shares, and all they have to do is wait for the passage of time, then that 10,000 shares is automatically included in there. Okay. However, if they say, we will give you 10,000 shares as long as our earnings increases by 20%, or our revenues increase by 50%, then you would not include those unless you actually achieve that in years one, two, and three. And then you would include it in diluted earnings per share for calculation for year one, year two, and year three, if you actually achieved that threshold. 
okay? But if it's just based on the passage of time, you automatically include it, okay? Let me show you, oh, one other thing on page 528, the bold print. Right above the letter M, which says corporate bankruptcy, earnings per share on comprehensive income and other comprehensive income components. Remember that on page 128, for our multiple step income statement, that's really a statement of earnings and comprehensive income. Earnings per share for comprehensive income and other comprehensive income is not required. It says EPS numbers below net income are not required by standard 130 for comprehensive income components. Remember, earnings per share is only required for income from continued operations, discontinued operations, extraordinary gains and losses, and net income. I D E net income. Okay, let's take a look at a multiple choice question. I believe I want to do is number 70. Okay, um, number 70 is found on page 541. Number 70 on page 541 says, for contingent issue agreements requiring the passage of time or an earnings threshold that is met before issuing stock, these should be included in, should you ever include contingent shares in basic earnings per share? No. No, it only is a factor in diluted earnings per share. So for the first column included in basic earnings per share, the answer would be no. Do you include it in computing diluted earnings per share? Well, the answer is it depends. If it's just based on the passage of time, yes, you include it. If it's based on a partic achieving a certain threshold, like reaching a certain threshold of earnings, did you meet the threshold? And it does say the earnings threshold is met, in which case the answer then would be yes for included in computing diluted earnings per share. So the answer there would be no and yes. The correct answer would be B, like Barbara for number 70. Now through the magic of video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase the board, I'm going to come back and I'm going to solve the simulation problem. So we're going to be working on next simulation number two. So I'll see you back. Okay, through the magic of video, I have halfway solved this problem. Beginning with simulation problem number two on page 546, let's read the situation. I'm on page 546, starting with simulation problem number two. The situation is that the M Corporation has incorporated in 2007. During 2007, the company issued 100,000 shares of $1 par value common stock for $27 per share. During 2008, the company had the following transactions. On January 2, 2008, they issued 10,000 shares of $100 par value cumulative preferred stock. The preferred stock is convertible into five shares of common stock, and it has a dividend rate of 6%. So this is cumulative convertible preferred stock. It was outstanding the entire year because they issued it on January 2nd of 2008. Then on March 1st, 2008, they issued 3,000 shares of common stock for legal services. The value of the legal services was 100,000. The stock is actively traded on a stock exchange. Okay. On July 1st of 2008, they issued 40,000 more shares of common stock for $42 per share. So you have to wait that. You have to wait the March 1st, you have to wait July 1st, of course. Um, they had 100,000 shares from the beginning of the year, from last year, so that was 100,000 as, as of January 1st, 2008. Then October 1st, 2008, they repurchased 16,000 shares of Treasury stock at $34 per share. They use the cost method. On December 1st of 2008, they sold 3,000 shares of Treasury stock. And then, and you have to wait that too, so you have to wait the October 1st to purchase and the December 1st sale of Treasury stock because they changed total shareholders' equity with those with Treasury stock transactions. Then on um, December 30th, they declared and paid a dividend of 20 cents per share on common stock, and then the 6% dividend on the preferred stock, which it wouldn't matter anyway because it was cumulative preferred stock, so you'd have to take the dividend anyway in the basic earnings per share. Then during 2007, they had net income of 250000 they paid dividends of 28000 During 2008, M Corporation had net income of 380000 Okay, so how do we solve this? After you read the situation, if you go to page 547, you have the calculation for the basic earnings per share, and they have the calculation for the diluted earnings per share. I already started the calculation for your basic earnings per share. When you have your calculation for your basic earnings per share, okay, so through the magic of video then, we have the calculations all done for you for the basic earnings per share. You take your net income, which is 380000 you're going to subtract the current year preferred stock dividend. You're automatically going to subtract this because it's cumulative preferred stock. Don't wor worry about whether it's convertible or not convertible because we're just doing basic right now. You're going to have 10,000 shares of the cumulative convertible preferred stock. 
You're going to multiply that at $100 par value per share, and then multiply that by 6%, which is the interest rate on the convertible cumulative preferred stock. That's going to give you $60,000 as your current year preferred stock dividend. You subtract that from the $380,000, so that's going to give you a numerator of $320,000. Then, to calculate the weighted average number of common stock shares outstanding, on January 1 of 2008, you start off with 100,000 shares. That was left over from 2007. You multiply that by 12 over 12, because they were outstanding all during the year. That's 100,000. Then on March the 1st, you used to do 3,000 more shares. I believe that was for services performed. From March 1st until December 31st is 10 months. So you multiply that by 10 over 12. That gives you 2,500 shares. Then on, 40, 000, uh, on July 1st, you issue 40,000 more shares for cash. So that's 40,000 times 6 months over 12 months because from July 1st to December 31st is 6 months. That gives you 20,000. Then on October 1st, you purchase treasury stock. 16,000 shares of treasury stock. Remember, that would decrease your, your shareholder's equity. The reason is because you're debiting treasury stock, you're crediting cash, your assets are going to go down, so your shareholder's equity is going to go down. So that would be a subtraction. 16,000 shares times from October 1st to December 31st is three months, times three months over 12 months, which is one-fourth. One-fourth of the 16,000 is minus 4,000. Then on December 1st, you resell 3,000 shares. Isn't that right? Yeah. Uh, December 1st, you sold 3,000 shares of the Treasury stock, so 3,000 shares times one month over 12 months, because from December 1st to December 31st is one month, so 3,000 times one over 12 is 250. So you take the 100,000 plus the 2,500 plus the 20,000 minus the 4,000 plus the 250 is going to give you 118,750 as your weighted average number of common stock shares outstanding. It's a 118,750. If you take 380 minus the 60,000, that's 320,000, 320,000 divided by 118,750, that's going to give you $2.69 for your calculation of your basic earnings per share. Now, what about for the diluted earnings per share? Well, if it's diluted earnings per share, then what's going to happen is that this is going to go away. And the reason is because this current year preferred stock dividend is for cumulative convertible preferred stock. So if we assume if these were converted, that becomes zero because they no longer get a preferred stock dividend because they now become shares of common stock, okay? And they go in their common stock equivalents. Now, the common stock equivalents would be, if you go back to page 546, they issued 10,000 shares of $100 par value cumulative preferred stock. The preferred stock was convertible into five shares of common stock and has a dividend rate of 6%. So if they have 10,000 shares, and each share of cumulative convertible preferred stock can become five shares of common stock, then you say, say, 10,000 times five, all right, it's going to be 50,000. So that becomes 50,000, and you still have to wait this. Remember, this happened on January 2nd of 2008 when they issued the convertible preferred stock. So this is issued all year long, okay? So it's outstanding all year long. So you're multiplying that by 12 months over 12 months, so that becomes 50,000 for your common stock equivalents. So, your net income is still 380000 Your current year preferred stock dividend is zero. Your weighted average number of common stock shares outstanding is 118750 And to that, you add another 50000 So it becomes 168750 So your numerator then is 380000 Your denominator then is 168750 And then, because it's 118750 plus another 50,000 shares, so it's 168750 And your diluted earnings per share then would be $2.25 per share. Remember, I also want you to read the communication and read the research. Read the problem and read the solution for the communication. Read the problem and read the solution for the research. Make sure you know how to do every single multiple choice question. Make sure you know how to calculate the basic and diluted earnings per share. For your diluted earnings per share, remember it went down to diluted became $2.25. That's when you see. You want to see that it's weaker. It's weaker than the basic. That's right. If diluted goes above, let's say diluted was calculated at $2.75. It went above, then it's anti-dilutive, and then basic and diluted would have to be the same. They could ask that one in a simulation, okay? But I don't see them asking something like that in a multiple choice, only in the simulation. Make sure you know how to calculate basic. Make sure you know how to calculate diluted. And I will see you in module 15 for the statement of cash flow.